my name is Mark Goskowitz. Welcome back to Fermented Foods. Um, uh, the, what, what you're going to learn today is uh, you're going to learn some of the basics of how to ferment a lot of veggies. Um, that's going to be the core of what we do. Um, but you're also going to learn how to do, uh, make some pickled eggs. Um, uh, so if we run down, what are the things that we'll learn how to do? We'll learn how to make some sauerkraut from, from scratch. Um, so, some pickles, you know, cucumber pickles. We'll, we'll learn how to make pickled eggs, pickled beets, um, and pickle, uh, pickled eggs. Um, and along the way, we end up talking about some other things. But those are the ones that you'll, you'll actually see me make. Oh, and kimchi, of course. Um, so so that, that one's like a, a nice spicy one. Um, yeah, so, so all in all, um, I, I imagine that the, the librarians here, they're, that they're, they're, they're going to pass along some information for you. Um, so, so there's, a, there's a, a link that's got like a, a handout that you can totally print out, but it's actually really handy in digital form because it has live links in it. And this was like my old version. I even updated it this morning. I noticed even a few other things I wanted to change. As long as you've got the link, you've got the most up-to-date version of this. That's the great thing about this. Um, and so, so as we like go through it, like it's got a couple recipes in here, but it really like some of the recipes that I'm going to be going from. They're from some books that um, that I bought, um, and we'll share some of those books as we go through. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah. My name is Mark Oskowitz from Tri Gable Lee Farm in Colchester, Connecticut. Um, I teach a lot of different classes. Um, this fermented foods one is, is, is one of my favorites. Um, I typically co-teach this one with my friend, John Wojtovich, um, who, who's a teacher with me at John Winthrop Middle School. Um, however, this is one of those ones where like me setting it up and everything, it was just like logistically a lot easier just to set this up uh, as a, just a, a me class. But John, what he brings to the class typically is how to talk about cultured, food, cultured uh, dairy products. Um, he, he talks about, you know, the cultured milk and butters um, and, and taking kefir, homemade kefir, and turning that into a lot of cultured dairy products at home. Um, me, the skill set I bring uh, that you'll hear me talk about is I, I just made a batch of kombucha this morning. Um, two batches of, of kombucha. These are in their secondary fermentation. That's another class that I teach. And there's, there's cold brew coffee next to that. I don't teach a coffee class, but I, I should. I used to work at Starbucks. Um, and I, I've got my own little espresso machine. I know how to do all those. Bottom line is that like our little farm, we've, we've transitioned over the years from growing things to teaching people about different things. And yeah, you know, like I, I teach about beekeeping, um, mushroom growing, and, and the kombucha class. And some of these are, they're pre-recorded and they're live and they're ready to go. Um, so shameless little plug about other classes that I teach. Um, but let's jump into the fermented foods. So, so some things, so just some, some language here. Um, we are talking about fermented foods, which is using uh, natural bacteria, yeast, fungi, you know, microorganisms to transform the food. Um, the term pickling, sometimes goes synonymous uh, with, with the term fermented foods. But I, you know, so like I'll say, we'll make pickles, but really what we're doing is we're fermenting them. We're making lacto-fermented pickles. Um, we're not using, we're not using vinegar. Um, to, so I've got a couple little things here that I'm gonna hold up in, in, as we go through this. So one of those terms that, that it, you know, we're not gonna learn how to make uh, vinegar-based pickles. Um, those would be like the pickles that you that you'd find on the grocery store shelf that are on the shelf in the grocery store in a can uh, or in a jar, um, and they don't need to be refrigerated. That's because they've they've been like heated up to a temperature that kills all of the bacteria and fungi that are in them. Um, they they're 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 dead. They don't you know they don't have any life to them. However, the pickles that we're going to learn to make, I'm just going to go to my fridge. They're going to be. The pickles that we'll learn how to make are going to be like these. I want you to see that cloudiness in there. And when I look at the ingredients on, on this brand of pickles, you know, store-bought brand of pickles, this was from the refrigerated area because these, these are alive and you're, you're keeping them alive in the refrigerator rather than canning them. Um, the ingredients for this are cucumbers, <laughs> brine, which is made with water and salt, garlic, lemon, their proprietary spices, and some cinnamon. Um, and the pickles that we're gonna make today, they're, they're very similar to this. Um, these are half sours. The difference between full sours and half sours is just that you kind of stop them from fermenting so long and you put them in the fridge to halt that process. So basically these didn't sit and ferment 
as long as full sour pickles. Um, and so, so they kind of taste a little more cucumbery than full pickly. All right, so, so as we're going into some of the language and everything, um, there are some recipes in this fermentation world um, that, that might use like an apple cider vinegar. Um, an apple cider vinegar is gonna be this different than a distilled vinegar. All right, so if you're making like bread and butter pickles, typically it's gonna involve distilled vinegar. It's gonna be, you know, the, the regular, regular vinegar-based pickle. But apple cider vinegar tends to be alive and it actually has a culture that's alive in it. And so you'll see this being used um, in ferments. So again, this whole class is about fermentation and that's what you're learning about. I'll put my props away, slide those away. Other things, so, in this like little handout that you got, um, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see like a little blue link down, down the way. And that blue link is for a little brown chart. Now, me, I've got some of this stuff pre-measured and stuff, so I'm not gonna be referring to the brine chart. That's just for efficiency sake of running a class. But for your own sake, brine charts are important. Um, it, there's a range. There's a, so what you're gonna get from this is you, you're gonna see that like, there are some hard and fast rules that you wanna stick with in fermenting to avoid poisoning yourself, giving yourself food poisoning, and having something rot and fester in a jar. And then there, there are some details that you don't have to pay attention to that are going to enhance the flavor. So salt, your salt and water ratios, those are one of those details that you have to pay attention to. Um, otherwise, it can result in a poor ferment. We'll, we'll talk about that. I've had some bad ones. Never eaten one because you open it up and you can smell it. Um, but anyway, Brine charts there, uh, you know, yeah, hold it up to the camera kind of thing. Um, I, I like to go with, I do a lot of fermenting with one quart, you know, a one with a one quart jar, it's about this size. Um, so this tells me about like, hey, with one quart of water, how many tablespoons of salt am I gonna have? Now, as we get into it, salt is important. I don't think I'm necessarily there yet. So, so I'm gonna generally go in the order of my handout. You don't have the handout, but if you were to print this out and rewatch this video again, I'm going to try and stick to the order of the handout. So I'm trying not to get ahead of myself on the salt. Part. So one thing I say is that when you're, when you're doing this, it tends to be like in these like summer months, because this is the time of year when you have access to lots of local fresh veggies. Um, what, what you're going to see in here are some links. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, hopefully you are, is CT Nofa. Um, and, and CT Nova is Connecticut's, um, you know, organic farming group. And they have put together this awesome collection of, um, uh, it's like a map. And you go to the map, you can find your local farm. I know, I, you know, I know there's a farmer's market in your, you know, in your town and near others near you on other days of the week. And you can look on, on that sheet and, or on that map and you can find farmer's markets in your areas you can find CSAs, which are community supported agriculture things where you subscribe to a local farm and you support them and you get fresh veggies. The reason I'm talking about this is because freshness is one of the first key things. I went to the farmer's market. I went on Sunday, so today's Wednesday. Yeah, the veggies have been sitting, but I put them right in the fridge, right from the farmer's market. They're still fresh enough. These are not veggies that have been shipped from California and they've been sitting you know, in, in, in the grocery store warehouse coolers and then shipped to the grocery stores. And it takes you know, weeks for those veggies to get to your house. They're old. Um, so, so freshness is the first key um, at, at getting, getting desirable products. If you're gonna take the time to do this, it, these are quick, these are easy. But if you want a good result, if you want pickles, cucumber pickles that snap, you want to start with a fresh cucumber first. Um, so, so the other thing is that you don't need to, you don't need to like buy anything fancy. Whatever grows locally in your area, you can pickle it, you can ferment it, you can do stuff with it. Um, the what you'll look for is you'll look for recipes that go along with the veggies that you have, um, rather than saying, "Hey, this is the recipe I have. Let me go find that veggie and that veggies." old and it came from somewhere else you know in the world what i encourage you to do is start with local veggies local produce and so look for those little connecticut grown signs you know you're you know at the at the grocery store as well the little ct grown signs um those are going to show that your your food is relatively 
uh, it, it's fresh it, it, and it comes from a relatively close market. All right, so uh, next thing to jump into is cleanliness. Okay, I've already washed my hands. Now this is my own home kitchen. I'm not making this to sell to anybody. Um, we would have to go to a whole nother level of cleanliness if, if I were looking to sell this little jar of ferments. I would actually have to work in a USDA certified kitchen. And I could, I could probably, you know, your local uh, soup kitchens and stuff. Uh, and, and a lot of churches tend to have kitchens that are certified by the USDA because they're serving food for the public. Um, I'm not, this is, this is your home kitchen fermentation. So the thing is, is that, yeah, I, I did take time already to like, you know, wash out my jars and my lids and get them all set up. Um, you know, they were brand new, um, but I'm not going to trust that. I washed them out. Now, so when we're talking about washing things and we're working with living organisms that, that we want to live and thrive in this jar, there's a couple important things is that if I leave soap residue in this jar after I wash it and I don't rinse it out well enough, that soap residue, well, it's going to linger in the food that we're going to eat. And well, that's not good, but never mind. That's also going to potentially hinder or kill the bacteria um, that, that we want to promote uh, in this jar. And then other bacteria that are toxic could take over. So cleanliness is important, but also making sure that you're not leaving any antibacterial soap inside your jars. That's important, just as important, um, so that you're rinsing them off. Also, um, if you're, uh, many people have city water, city water is chlorinated. Um, a lot of uh, that chlorination is made to kill off microorganisms. So what do you do? Well, if you want, you know, an easy thing to do would be to, you know, find somebody with well water, get some well water or find a spring, a local spring and, you know, fill up, a, fill up some jugs for that um, or go to your grocery store and buy some distilled water. What you can also do, and I don't know, if a lot of people necessarily know this is, you know, go ahead and get your, get your stock pot out, get a, get a big pot, fill it up with your city tap water and let it sit out overnight. Now, overnight, the chlorine, the, the chlorine from that is going to off gas from the water to a point where the bacteria that we want to grow uh, in here won't be hindered by the chlorine anymore. So, so these, these are important things. These are, that's why you're here at this class. These are those tiny details that if you did get a fermentation book, they have that listed, but you'd have to take the time to read. You can't just jump ahead to the, you know, the chapter on the recipe that you want and you overlook some of these details. This is why you take a class and you learn some of those. So we're hearing that cleanliness is important. Freshness is very important. We also, do, you know, we don't want to leave soap residues around. We also do, um, want to pay attention to the water that we're using, that it is good, clean water. Because when we're fermenting, we are, we, we are, uh, it's a big water-based process. Um, so I'm a middle school teacher. This would be the point where, you know, I'd have, I'd have a student come over and I'd be like, hey, here's Jack. We're gonna pickle Jack today. And we imagine submerging Jack underwater. So here's the thing is that if you put Jack underwater and you hold him underwater in a big giant jar, well, eventually he dies. That's because Jack needs you know, oxygen to breathe and, and to survive. And, and so, so a similar thing kind of happened. So with this, there are bacteria, fungi, and yeast, little tiny colonies that have landed on this. And even from my own hands, as I was peeling this beet, that have landed on this. But those, as we submerge those under the water and put them in an area that in, in brine, in salt water, that salt water ends up killing and becomes an environment that, that a lot of uh, bacteria, yeast, and fungi that are out in the open don't like. But our friends that can survive in that brine, lactobacillus. So there's, there's lots of different, um, there's lots of different bacteria out there that are, there's, there's not just one type of bacteria in here, but there's several different strains of lactobacillus bacteria. You think if you get a, you know, a culture of yogurt, you get a little thing of yogurt and you see it's got active cultures and you look, they might even list like L, bacillus, blah, blah, blah you know, all these Latin names, I'm not gonna list them off, but like each one of those is a strain of bacteria that's used in that culture. As you breathe, mask or no mask, we're breathing, you know, we are breathing in bacteria, yeast and fungi, spores that are just in the air. Um, 
And, and so, so what we are going to do is put them in a salt water brine. I like to think of this as the, as, as like recreating like the early stages of earth in like the salt, salty sea almost. It, I know it's not quite a, a, the perfect analogy, but imagine this is a salty sea. The things that are gonna live in here are not going to have access to oxygen because we're going to close this off from being able to introduce more oxygen to it. And they're also gonna be in this highly salty environment. Now what that's going to do is kill off a lot of bad bacteria, fungi, and yeast. And the, the ones that survive are going to be the ones that transform these carrots and that garlic into pickled carrots. Um, so overall, they're, they're going to, to th that, this is a full batch of pickled carrots that are like, this is from like February, a class I taught in February. And it's like, you know, the carrots themselves, it's like, look at, look at that, that's, that's how they transform. They, the tissue of this has, it's still got like, it's still got some snap to it. And it tastes like garlic, garlicky carrots are great. Um, this would be the point that if we were in a live class, I'd pass around a little jar and be like, hey, as a friend, if you want to try some. Um, so you're going to learn how to make pickled carrots. All right. I can't, sorry, I can't eat and talk yourself. But my, my point with this is that you're seeing right there the transformation um, at a cellular level that the bacteria do to the carrot. They are, they are going to eat the sugars you know, the, the amounts of sugars in there. And what they're going to do is they're going to, if you're working with middle schoolers, they're going to fart out carbon dioxide gaps. So the processing here is one where this becomes, the oxygen gets used up and they are just producing carbon dioxide gas. If I, you know, I can, I can still get like little gas bubbles. So just like there's carbonation in here. Um, just like in my kombucha, there's carbonation in my kombucha and other fermented things. That's from the, um, from the carbon dioxide gas that is produced as a byproduct. Now that also enhances this brine situation and it makes it more likely that that lactobacillus, because it's in that acidic carbon, carbon, carbon dioxide infused, low oxygen, salty, um, environment and it thrives. And that's, that's why I keep holding this up, but that's why this is, it's cloudy. Um, I actually let this sit out a bit so that there wouldn't be condensation on it. Um, and you can see that there, there's a cloudiness in this right now. Um, and that's from the bacteria that are in there. Okay. So, all right, some time has passed. Oh, and what are we learning here? So let's get into the, we've gone over the basics, some of the basics of what we're doing. We're trying to encourage a bacterial growth to transform the food. Again, we are, we're not going to preserve them in vinegar. We're going to preserve them in this like bacterial acidic soup that the, the bacteria kind of make their own sharp vinegar, their acidic vinegar themselves. Um, okay, so basic equipment, total basic equipment. Like I said already, um, you're, you're going to need some jars, all right? I like wide mouth jars. I don't have any small mouth jars, all right? So this, this is a... Um, this is a quart jar and there's its wide mouth lid. I want you to see that on the quart size that the lid is almost just as big as, as the, um, the body of the jar. Um, even, even this little tiny one, this is a wide, a wide mouth. It's gotta be like a pint or a, yeah, a pint or a half pint. It's a, a little itty bitty one. Um, but other jars, if you're, if you're going to go for volume with this, you might get some half gallons. Now these are two two quarts. All right. So you might get half gallon jars or you might go as big as these gallon jars over here. If you're really, if you're really going to be making a lot, you know, four quarts make a gallon Four of these make one gallon. Now when I'm doing liquids, I'm doing my kombucha. Um, I want to make, I want to make gallons, you know, a gallon of this at a time. So uh, that's why I use these gallon jars for this. But do I need a gallon of pickles? No, no. I want to make these by the quart. Why do I want to make these by the quart? Because remember, these are going to sit on the counter for some time, ferment, and then I'm going to move them into the refrigerator to stop that fermentation process. Do I want to put a gallon jar in my refrigerator and have it take up all that space, especially as I dwindle down? Now, what you could do is you could ferment them in the gallon one and then divide them out into smaller jars afterwards. 
um, that's totally fine um, along the process. But I, I prefer to kind of like make it one or two of these at a time. That's what you're going to see in this process. It's not overwhelming. You go to the farmer's market, you pick up a few extra cucumbers, a few extra carrots or beets or a head of cabbage, and you make a jar. All right. And so, um, so mason jars, they're, they're universal. Um, they're, you know, I suggest getting a 12 pack of them if you're getting into this. The fermentation lids. Now, now what you're going to see is that, is that these jars, they've got a couple, a couple lid options. Now you've got this that has the collar and the flat little lid here. Um, that's what they come with standard. Now that's kind of like, you know, kind of a pain in the butt to like have to, it, there's no big deal. Um, but when this is in the fridge and you want pickles quick, you don't want to have to deal with this thing. So maybe you get a, a couple of these little plastic lids for when they're in the refrigerator. While they're fermenting, these are totally fine. Um, you, there's going to be a uh, gas buildup in this, carbon dioxide gas buildup. And so we don't end up ever crunching these down tight. These are made for um, high pressure canning. Um, which that's a whole nother class. I, I really don't teach that one anymore because so many people are interested in this versus the big old boiling thing where you, you lower the jars in and everything. Um, that's a whole nother process and it takes a lot more of a, equipment. These jars are made to sit on the shelf and hold, hold that pressure. However, however, since we're fermenting in these, these can build up so much pressure that this top builds, uh, like blows off. And if you're fermenting peppers to make uh, a hot sauce, which is awesome, you should totally do that. If you love hot sauce, buy your own peppers, ferment your own peppers, make your own hot sauce, take those peppers and then put them in a blender once they're done fermenting and then put them in little jars and then name it, you know, give each one its own name, do it with any old hot peppers you want. Point being is that <laughs> there are pictures, go ahead and Google later on or on the side, uh, pictures of, of hot sauce fermentations that have exploded. And it's like all over other people's ceilings. Um, so these, you'll want to burp them every day, a couple times a day. And you'll get the, you know, just like when you open up a, a, a soda, you don't shake that soda up. But if, when you open up a, a bottle of soda and you hear that, that's the same sound that you're going to hear with this when you open up a little bit. Um, it's not going to be as pressurized as a bottle of soda. But if you let it sit for days without doing that, that's where the, the, another thing comes in is that they make these, these little, um, these little airlocks. So these are one way little airlocks, which I'm not sure if I can, eh, they, they kind of like, there you go. With, with the eighth graders, you just start to say, and so there are these nipples that you put on the jar and you just lost all the eighth graders. They're all, they're like, he said nipples. Okay. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so look at that. So that replaced the little, uh, the metal lid. And what happens is that I, I strategically use these on ferments that I know are going to be, need to be burped several times a day. And in the time before I worked from home, you know, if we go back to full, school full time and I've, got, and I've got something fermenting on the counter, I'm going to end up um, using some of these again. I don't need to use these in the summer when I'm home and everything, um, but this lets the air out, but doesn't let air back in. That's a, the, so there's a little one-way valves. Now, you know, so these are good enough for our fermentation. Um, by the way, on the on the, the sheet, there's a resources and Amazon materials list at the bottom. You don't have to buy it and support Amazon, but if you want the products that I'm using in here, I give you links to them. I, and I did buy them from Amazon, honestly. So, um, so like this little pack of those uh, of those little airlocks is what you could get. You do not. We are not talking about airlocks like this. I have this as a prop to say. The fermentation that we're going to do, you don't need this. You don't need that type of airlock. Um, this would be for if you're getting into wines and beers and 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 things where you really need to dial in the, the, the oxygen control and, and, and everything within it. This is simple fermentation that your grandparents, you know, probably knew how to do. Um, okay, so what else we got as my props here? Hold on. I'm gonna clean things up so we talk about the airlock. Bye-bye. We talked about these little nipple things. I don't need them now. I don't need them today because I'm going to be home this week to burp these jars. Um, what else? Get rid of that. Okay. Now another another thing of materials that I do suggest is um, we just got two more materials to talk about. Are these little glass weights? Okay. 
um, the, these are, you know, they are called fermentation weights and they fit inside. You're going to see me use these today. So I don't need to do a big demonstration of them other than to say that right at the top, these little materials, you'll see this one has like a little, a uh, uh, little uh, part in the middle to hold on to while this one's got a little harder to grab this one. I would say if you had two different styles to choose, choose this one with that center hold. Um, this one's, this one's just a little harder to get unless you got small fingers, but this is going to hold down, um, these carrots, they had a fermentation weight in them in the early stage to hold the carrots down below so that none of the carrots are sticking up in the, in the air above the brine. It keeps them below the brine. And again, you're going to see me use these. I'm going to put them on my clean table so that we'll use those later. So, so far, just like a few materials, mason jars maybe some specialty lids, maybe those weights, those, those weights. The last thing that you definitely need besides your food is salt, and it's the right kind of salt. So the first one is the no-no. No, 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 no. Um, iodized salt um, has iodine in it, which we need micro doses of iodine, and that's why they add that to regular table salt, um, it is because it was found that it was an easy way across the population to give them that little bit of iodine that they needed for their thyroid to work properly. Um, we don't use this because it hinders bacterial growth when we use it. So bye-bye iodized salt, table salt. All other salts besides these two. Kosher salt, that's fine. You got that in your kitchen cabinet, that's okay. However, because it's so coarse, you're going to want to measure it out and do everything by weight um, rather than by tablespoon and teaspoon. A lot of the recipes that are done by tablespoons, um, they are talking about tablespoons of a pickling salt, not necessarily a kosher salt. Just that there are going to be different differences in them. So pickling salt, this is what I use. It's very, very fine. It doesn't have anything added to it. Um, it also doesn't have anything, anything like there's no, it's not like sea salt or anything where you might get other um, elements in it. It's pretty pure. It's pretty pure, but it doesn't have iodine in it. And it's also very fine grain, so it dissolves very easily. All I need to do is kick on the tap water uh, on, on hot. Use regular hot tap water with this, and it dissolves easily. All right, we're like 25 minutes in, half an hour in. Let's actually get to some, some of the recipes. Um, so, we talk, yeah, we talked about the, all right, all right. So, so, yeah, did we talk about the water? Yeah, we talked about the importance of water. We talked about the salt. Sugars, okay, so some of these ferments, they're gonna include sugars. Um, this is one of those times where if you're starting out and you're following a recipe, I say the same thing with the kombucha class one, that you actually do wanna use your standard white, you know, granulated sugar. This stuff is, I know it's like not good for your body to have this type of sugar, but here's the thing is that we are feeding the bacteria this sugar. They are transforming that mostly into acids and carbon dioxide. So here's the thing is that there's only one recipe we're going to talk about today that has a little bit of sugar in it to kick it off. And that's the kimchi. The kimchi has a little bit of sugar in it. And my point is, is that I'm not going to substitute. I'm not going to go, uh, you know, all granola on this and, and, and substitute, um, you know, local raw honey because that local raw honey has back has like um, it has it has yeasts in it that will throw off the microbiology that's going on. When when I do the kombucha class, that's one where it's like you really you really do stick with this type of sugar and you experiment with other sugars because you could get mold growth and stuff like that. Things that we don't want. Um, so point B, a part of this is talking about following recipes. And if, we've, if we're following recipe and it says sugar, we're going to assume it's that sugar. And if it says the salt, we're, we're going to assume that it's talking about this pickling salt. Um, so other things, other things. Um, you may need cheesecloth in some of these ferments, uh, maybe to put over the top so it can breathe or not. No, uh, none of the recipes we're doing today involve cheesecloth. Um, however, uh, just some, some things as you get into books, this says pickling on it. Okay. So if you pickling, mm, this is going to involve vinegar based pickling and fermented based pickling. So it's, it's not when you get into, you know, this is a great book, but it's about canning and preserving. 
nearly every recipe in this book is about vinegar based food. It's not lacto fermentation based. Preserving the harvest, awesome book, gets into dehydrating, all, all sorts of things. But then again, this is not, this has only one small chapter on fermentation, which is what we're talking about today. So these are all the, my props of things to talk about. Again, maybe a little 12 bucks kitchen scale. You use this more than you realize once you have one in your kitchen. Um, so I use that to, to weigh out my salt and some of my ingredients. Now, what books are good books if you want to learn more about this? You see how has that word fermentation in the, in the title? This is, a, this is one of the go-to books. Um, so I'm going to show you three go-to books that great off the shelf. A ask your local library to like stock them so you can check them out. Um, or buy them for your own. I actually have these in print and I have them like on my Kindle. Um, because sometimes I'm, I'm in a different place. I'm at somebody's house. I want the recipe or blah, blah, blah. So it, it travels with me. Fermentation for Beginners, excellent book. Um, home Fermentation, that's like the next, the next one. So this one, this one's, you know, not as thick, not as many recipes for this beginner book. But it's, I would say, start off with that one if you want to learn more step up to that. Um, and this one is a good one. And it's see how it's got fermentation in the book. The other one, there was that DIY um, pickling book. Oh no, oh, there we go. The DIY pickling book. If you want, to, want a lot of the recipes that I'm gonna talk about today, they are from these books that have fermentation in the title. So Mark, let's actually do something. Okay, we're gonna start with sauerkraut. Sauerkraut, big bowl, big bowl. So you can make sauerkraut just with a head of cabbage and salt. No water added, because what we're gonna find out is the water comes from, from this, um, from the cabbage itself. This is heavy. Um, I weighed it out earlier and um, it's, it was nearly like a three pound head of cabbage. The recipe calls for two pounds. So once I take the core out and everything and I, and I peeled it and everything, I'm hoping that there's about two pounds left over. The, the thing though is that when I'm following the recipe, it says, that I want four tablespoons of salt for a two pound head of cabbage. So here's the thing, if I were to use a four pound of cabbage, twice the size of this, and still use the same amount of salt, that's a no-no. You need to scale things up. You need to know the weights of some of your things. So, so remember, there are details that you've gotta pay attention to. Weights and measurements are one of those when it comes to salt and your main ingredient. Because, and salt and water, because we want the right, um, the right consistency for the brine. We want that to be just the right salinity. Not so salty that when you eat it, you're like, oh, oh no, oh, that's bad. But, and not, to, um, not so little salt that it doesn't create that salt water environment and other bacteria take off. So here, I'm gonna, all right, so I'm gonna kick down to here. Um, all right, yes, I'm wearing, I'm wearing shorts. Now it's official. Um, in other ingredients that we're gonna incorporate later, I do like juniper berries in my, in my sauerkraut and I like caraway seeds in my sauerkraut. Um, those are gonna be later on. And I start with this one just because I think it's kind of important to see like this is as basic as it can be. What I am gonna do is just kind of slice. So this is where you get to see a little bit of the prep. All right, the core, I'm gonna pour it. Set that aside and I can give it to my chickens. Nobody wants to cut themselves on film. Okay, so what am I looking for with this? I'm looking for a nice, a nice fine shred. So I'm basically just quartering these and then I'm imagining what, 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 what kind of texture do I want for, for a final texture for this? So, so I'm gonna go for a nice little fine slice. Could you put this in a mandolin or, or a food processor? Sure, I just, I kind of like how like, they're gonna be long and stringy um, and thin. My daughter this morning cut her finger with, uh, with a knife. Her, her brother, her younger brother asked her to cut up a, um, I was out of the house and my wife was, my wife was upstairs and my daughter, uh, my son asked her to cut him up a peach. And she accidentally got her finger. You know, it's gonna happen one of those days. If you're cooking, you're gonna get cut with a knife. So the whole cabbage, here's, here's the thing. I want you to imagine that, that this whole cabbage, the whole thing, it might just fit in this jar. It's always a tight fit, but that's what we'll see at the end. The process for this is one where 
it's not that complicated and it's going to sit for about a half an hour. That's why I'm doing this recipe kind of uh, first. It's one of the first recipes. Okay, so with this, I'm gonna combine four tablespoons of pickling salt. Thinking about it, I probably could have had that pre-measured, but that's okay. If you remember being in your classes, you want that to be like, you know, a level tablespoon. I'm gonna add all four now. All right, here's where now we massage massage this into there. So I'm massaging the salt. I'm gonna, my, the action that I'm doing is one where I kind of do this. I kind of turn it and twist it. That's mine. You can, have, you can do all sorts of other mixing things. But what I want to do is really work the salt into the cell structure um, right at that cellular level. And so, so here's the thing is that I can feel my hands are starting to get wet and that's because the salt is pulling moisture out of this, um, out of the cabbage already. See, this is why you needed a deep bowl. It's not just about having a big bowl, it's about having a deep bowl so that you don't end up with stuff all over your countertop. But this is a great thing to do with kids. And then you're like, hey, go ahead, you get to mix it. Your kids will have a blast doing this. My kids love it. Breaking. You know, so I had a little piece there was kind of stuck together. So I'm going to break it apart, make sure salt gets on it. This is good enough. So I'm going to wash my hands. Er, I'm going to wash my hands. Um, and we've got this bowl of salty cabbage. And we'll, we'll season it a, a little later. I'm just going to set it off to the side. How long does that have to sit? Depends. Usually, um, usually 20 30 minutes is gonna be fine enough. If you have the time, let it go to 30 minutes. Um, that'll really pull out more moisture from that. And, you know, looking at the clock, I think we got the time to do that. So, what's next? Newcomers. Newcomers. All right, this one. This one's gonna be from start to, start to finish. So, I've made cucumber pickles. From, you know, so these are these are pickling cucumbers. Why are they pickling cucumbers? Well, they're short. They're gonna fit in the jar nicely without wasting a lot of the cucumber flesh themselves. Um, another thing that makes them pickling cucumbers is, um, is, is just the texture and everything that you get from this. Imagine having like a salad cucumber that's twice as big or, or like those gigantic, um, those gigantic curly cucumbers and everything, the greenhouse cucumbers. Um, you can make pickles from them. The texture is going to be different. So what you get with a pickling cucumber is you get a specific texture, which is the same texture from your store-bought pickles. Um, okay, so we've got pickling cucumbers. We've got like a little collection of them here. Um, I've got some garlic. We'll go through each of these. I don't have to peel this because as we eat it, we're gonna eat the skin. But there is a little bit of prep with this. Some other things, some other things. So. <laughs> Remember, I said I do these pickling glasses in the winter with my students. Um, we've made them with winter cucumbers grown who knows where and shipped to Connecticut in the middle of winter. Um, and we make those pickles just so the kids can take one out and eat it and go, oh, bleh, that's a mushy pickle. Oh, so here's what we've got. Is that like, if you're working with, if, so this is used, um, this, you know, um, this is, this is way just extra crunch. There's, um, I think it's basically just calcium chloride. Yeah, yep, says it right there, calcium chloride. It adds a little bit of calcium to it, which helps preserve the crunch. Do you need this? No. But if you are experimenting with other types of cucumber pickles, if you're doing vinegar pickles, I highly recommend that you do this because when you make vinegar pickles or, or um, the, the sweet pickles, those typically involve cook, you know, using the stove top and cooking, which is going to soften the pickles and adding this is going to preserve the crunch. 
Um, so if you're doing any kind of canning with the pickles, I would suggest you, you add something like that. However, our, the way that we're pickling today, we don't need it. Here's what we've got is that we have um, a natural ingredient that's growing right now, raspberry leaves, oak leaves, or, um, or grape leaves. These we're going to add to the mix. We're gonna to add to this, to this ferment because they end up adding tannins to it that help preserve the crunch of the, of the cucumber. Could, could we make them without this? Yeah, they'd just be a little mushy, but this would be really do preserve it. So, um, you know, today I'm gonna to abandon on the, uh, so if it was raspberry leaves, I literally went out to my raspberry plants, just plucked off a few leaves. Um, went out to my grape, grape plants and plucked off a few grape leaves. By the way, if, you, if you're of a, a Greek culture or you, or you like how they, you know, all those dishes that have grape leaves, pickled grape leaves wrapped, wrapped around, I forget what the dishes are, you know what they are or whatever, but pickled grape leaves is the same process that we're going to do today, except you just don't put the cucumbers in, you just put the brine with the pickled leaves. It's, it's an amazing thing. So blah, 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 and you fill the whole jar with leaves. All right, so we're going to transition down to here. Um, as we do a bit of cutting. I guess before that, I'm just gonna get a brine ready. Remember, I've got my handy dandy brine chart. <laughs> it's like, please, please. But, um, and I've got, I already have this measured out. Um, this is two and a half uh, tablespoons, not teaspoons, tablespoons. Don't make that mistake. You want the big, the big measurements, two and a half tablespoons. The, the ratio is typically between two to three tablespoons for a quart of water. Um, and so am I gonna use all this water now? No, no. I'm gonna use this for one recipe and then for another recipe. So here's the thing. Is that what I'm really gonna do? Is I'm gonna make two quarts of this right now. I'm gonna put that salt. I'm gonna put that salt in here. And then I'm gonna add another one. So this is basically five tablespoons of salt. And I'm just gonna make a big honking thing of brine using hot water. I don't know if you've ever uh, shaken things that have air in them in a hot liquid and they explode on you. I'm gonna do it over the sink. All right, see, there's not a lot of air in that. It's mostly filled with water. All right, so what are we making? We're making salt water. Let's go take a swim in this. Uh, our cucumbers are gonna take a swim in this. I used to be a bartender at TGI Fridays. Big mess. All right, and well, that's true though. I used to work at Starbucks, used to be a bartender. And basically, uh, 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 I, I wanted to become a mixologist and learn how to make any, anything. Hot, cold, uh, alcoholic, non-alcoholic. That's where the kombucha came in, fermented, not fermented. Um, okay, so basically, I'm looking at this and seeing, are, yeah, there, there's air bubbles up here, but the salt, if there was still salt that needed to be dissolved, it would be down here. So I'm looking here, I don't see any crystals down there. This is dissolved, my brine is ready to use. So I'm gonna set that off to the side. Okay, and I've got a jar, you know, that I'm gonna to use to pack my pickles in. So um, I like to put a grape leaf at the bottom and then a grape leaf on the top. Um, I could use dried dill, but I'm gonna use a small sprig of dill. Now here's the thing, dill goes a little, goes a long way in a recipe like this. So I'm just gonna use that little bit of dill, um, the garlic, so I've just got a garlic clove, just gonna give it a smash, peel it, and put it in crushed. I'm not gonna go you know, crazy chopping it. That garlic becomes, um, by smashing it, you are breaking up the cell structure and it actually releases a uh, chemical, uh, Allison uh, is the name of the chemical, and it changes the, the flavors altogether of it. Boom, so we got some garlic, we got the grape leaves, we got a little bit of dill. Uh -huh. Man, this is, if you would be in the room with me right now, you'd be smelling that garlic. Okay, so here's, here's some other things that we could have in the recipe. So, um, and you know, some onion, red onion, white onion, whatever, um, some other options besides the cucumbers. Uh, a jalapeno pepper, you can put other, other kinds of chili peppers in here and everything. Uh, I, I, so this thing, I'll admit, I am not somebody who likes spicy food. However, there is something magical that happens. This imparts some crazy, amazing flavor to these pickles that I can't get any other way. Do I eat the jalapenos? Mm, sometimes. I'm gonna leave everything in there 
it doesn't seem to add heat to the peppers. It add, it's just flavor. So, but if you use other chili peppers, you might be able to get some heat to this too. So make some hot peppers um, if, if that's what you like. So I'm just going to quarter this because I know that like, you know, in my cooking and everything, I like to pull one of these pickled peppers out and I'll chop it up and use it in another dish. So I'll get those in. Okay, all these flavors are gonna mingle. Um, the, the onions, the same thing. I'm gonna hold off and put these in kind of with the cucumbers as I, as I put them in the jar. But I've just kind of got some little slices. So this is basically a quarter onion. If you're, depending on how big your onion was, this was a big onion. So if you had a little onion, one whole onion would go in there. Um, mustard seeds, typically mustard seeds is, is, is part of the recipe and, and um, maybe a little cinnamon stick, maybe a little uh, black peppercorns. So here's the thing, pickling spices, they have a lot of those ingredients in it. Now, I, I know pickling spices tend to be used for making like a, um, a oh, come on, brain fart. You're at home, you're like, yeah, well, St. Patty's Day, the uh, pickled, what the, yeah, you know what I mean. Oh, uh, yeah, that pickled meat during St. Patty's Day. There you go, that's what you get. <laughs> so anyway, I'm gonna add a tablespoon um, of this to the mix, all right? And these even have some dried chili peppers in them. So go ahead, we'll give them one of them chili peppers. When I look at this mix, it's got cinnamon stick, mustard seeds, uh, peppercorns, allspice, chili pepper, bay leaves, and orange peel. So this is, you know, again, did I do just mustard seed and black peppercorns? No, I went with something that's a little more complex. Let's go back down here, okay. All right, so how do you prepare these? Basically, um, you know, I don't want any of these sticking up above the water level in there. All of these little pickling cucumbers, they are already perfectly fine. Now, could I, could I do these as holes, as, as whole pickles? Yeah, but I'm gonna do these as halves. You could do spears, you could do rounds, whatever you like. I personally like halves. Um, and then if I want spears, I go another step. Now, here's, here's the only prep work that you're gonna see that I'm doing. Because these naturally fit in the jar, one thing that I am doing is that there's a, um, let's see, there's the stem end. This is where the st it went to the plant. And there is the blossom end. This is where the flower was on it. The blossom end is the part that keeps growing as the cucumber gets older and older and older. Um, this end has enzymes in it that can make this bottom part of the pickle um, make it soft. And actually that's what I found with these pickles here is that they did not cut off the blossom ends and the bottoms of those pickles are kind of mushy. So I don't want that. So that's the only thing that you're seeing me do. I'm for texture wise, I'm taking, you know, the stem side off, but I'm also taking that bop, the blossom side off. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. All right. How many pickles, how many cucumbers can we fit in a jar? My son was like, can I have cucumber for lunch today? I was like, no, I need them all. I don't need them all, but um, all right. So I'm gonna start with that, we'll see. We'll see how they fit. So I like to load the jar kind of at an angle and get them all in. Now it's okay if they end up like, you know, kind of rejoining each other, creating, a, so just packing them in, packing them in. All right, so here's the thing is that these, when I pack them in, I can't fit no more in there. So there's where my little wedges of onion come in. I'm gonna shove those onions in, in the spaces where I've got some room. So when we think about that, that was like, you know, what is it, three, three and a half? You can go back in the video and count how many that was. With the onion, what I wanna do is make sure that none of them kind of go above this line. I'm, I'm shoving them in so that they stay below that line. Now, if I didn't have enough pickles to wedge in, cucumbers to wedge in here and, the, and they would float, I would add one of my handy dandy little fermentation weights to hold them below the, the brine level. So honestly, we're, we're right there, we're right there. So we've got this, the raw ingredients are in there. I'm looking down, I've used everything except one more, one more grape leaf. I'm just gonna toss on the top, kind of tuck it in. Tuck it in, tuck it in, tuck it in. And again, that's gonna kind of, that's gonna kind of keep anything that might float, just keep it below the brine level. And then now we're back to taking my brine and trying not to make a mess. Okay. 
I'm getting any, you know, big air bubbles out. So here, hopefully we can do like a little close up here. Hopefully you see a detail with this. You see the, the water line, the, the brine line is right there. Everything is below that brine line. And when I put a top on this, I put my little metal top on this. What that's going to do is create an airspace. So as carbon dioxide gets produced by the bacteria in here, there's an airspace for it to build up. Now I didn't jam this on, I just did finger tight on this. And now this goes to my fermentation station, you know, over here. I basically have a little pan uh, in a counter, uh, on my counter that, now I don't keep them in my kitchen here where it's like the sun, you know, the sun can kind of hit it and everything. I actually have these in, you know, over here in the dining room in a, in a little nook on a shelf over there outside the kitchen. Basically, I don't want these to be in direct sunlight. Um, the UV rays from the light, if I were to put these in direct sunlight, those could kill the bacteria and fungi that were trying to grow and then we could get other things growing in there. Tiny details, anything to worry about? No, you just find your own fermentation station. Now, why am I putting it on a pan? Well, because if this is packed and it, and it, and it starts to drip out, you know, some of those like juices from in there, the pan's gonna catch it. Um, and this pan, like it, it's aluminum, it reacts with the acids in there. I mean, would I ideally be using an aluminum pan? No, but like, that's what I use, it's fine. So, okay, boom, fermentation started. Okay, so how long is that gonna take? Um, so, so here's the thing, um, we're in kind of warmer months right now, basically I'm gonna be burping that, taking the jar and just going, in the morning when I wake up, and then in the evening before I go to bed, I go and I burp my little babies, my little jar babies. Now with something that's active, I might do all my burping over the sink. I found with carrots, they can get so crazy, tons of sugars in those carrots that they can really produce lots of carbon dioxide and it bubbles up and then it's like, ah, it's dripping all over the place. So if you burp them over the sink, you can give them a rinse off and everything. Um, so you're burping your little jar babies in the morning, um, you know, and in the afternoon. And so here's the thing, if in the afternoon you're burping it, it's like, okay, then maybe you need to burp it a couple times more during the day. <laughs> or you need to use one of those fancy little, you know, airlock uh, nipple lids that we were talking about earlier. Um, but, you know, you might be like, oh, well, how about I just like leave it looser? You don't want the gas to be able to really get in here, okay? If gas can get in, then there's the potential that other bacteria and fungi could get in and colonize on the top of that and then spoil it. So, um, Let's jump into another recipe. So we've got, um, so I'm gonna keep going with the brine. I'm gonna keep going with that brine that I've got made. So I might not be going in the order of everything. Yep, um, just gonna clean a little. Okay. All right. Pickled beets, pickled carrots. What you're going to see now is you're going to see the repetition. Repetition is the key to learning. And in making fermented foods, you're going to learn that, yes, there's an art to it. There's a feel for it. As the temperature changes in the summer, it gets really hot. And if you're in, if you're in an, you know, if your house isn't air conditioned, your ferments are going to go like, they're going to cook along. Um, they're going to really start to repopulate quickly. And you might have to do it in the basement, or you might not be able to do it during some months if you, if you don't have air conditioning, because it might just move so fast um, that you might not get the re desired result. Um, a lot of pickling is kind of best done in those like lower temperatures that, that a basement has. However, my house is air conditioned and it's not crazy cold, but it's cold enough to keep it out of those like 80 degree ranges. That's, that's gonna, that would kind of be bad for a lot of ferments. Um, so um, you're gonna see repetition in the steps of this, preparing food, clean jars, clean water, and a brine for, for a lot of these. So pickled beets, super simple, I'm gonna get another jar. Okay, so I've got another clean jar. I already, I already chopped up some of these beets. And um, I did not want, I did not want my hands to get stained crazy red and then have to work with my computer. So I'm right-handed. My right hand will use the knife. My left hand will touch the beets. Basically with all of these beets, how did I get them like this? Yeah, and you know, how did I, I get them like that? That's what I'm gonna show you. So all these beets, they're gonna go, they're gonna go in the jar. 
And then that last beat, I'll show you how I prepared it. Pickled beets are one of the easiest ones because there's, they have so, so, such a complex flavor already when you pickle them that they're, I, I really haven't found a need to add any other, any other spice or anything to, to the mix. So uh, we got a lot of stuff going on here. A lot of, a lot of visual clutter. There we go. Okay. Um, so as we go, so how did I prepare that beet there? Um, beets are round. And like my daughter found out this morning, when you cut things that are round, uh, they can move on you. So the first thing I do is I pinch from the sides. Uh, you know how to cut things, but not everybody does. So, so pinching from the sides and then having it, that's going to be a, a good way to create a stable foundation. Now they don't roll, no matter what you do to them. And then all I'm going to do is I'm looking for relative consistency and thickness. I'm going for something that is about, um, about an eighth of an inch thick. Why am I looking for cons consistency? Well, because this is a root vegetable. Yeah, it's got some sugars in it, but not as high as the, the fruits would have. Um, but it's really dense. It's really fibrous. And I want each one of these slices to pickle and to, to transform at about the same rate. If I were to make some of these thin and some of these thick and maybe some of these like whole big chunks like that, um, the center of this wouldn't get pickled like these would. They wouldn't become as tender quickly and the, the flavors just wouldn't penetrate. So we're looking for consistency. Okay. That's it for that. You'll see me use gloves twice. One for these because they stain, and then one for um, one for the kimchi because of the spices. So now what am I gonna do? I've got my, my main ingredient, my vegetables, that are kind of low in sugar, low in acid, this root vegetable, and I'm just gonna add brine to it. Remember, this is not water, this is salt water. This is that brine, and I'm just gonna bring it to a level. Now those beets, they just started to float, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna drop a weight in, and we'll get a little close up of this, is that, here's the thing, is that as I push that weight in, I can push those beets further down I'm going to go to the sink and pour some of this off so I have the same air space that I had before. There we go. So this, this weight is pushing those beats below. Um, and then again, you know, I'm just going to add the lid, put it on finger tight. How long is this going to ferment? I think I, I, I kind of over, overlooked on the pickles, on the cucumber pickles. You're going to burp these babies every day. You're going to burp these babies every day. How fast is this ferment and how fast is this ferment? Um, these, they're a lot more fibrous than uh, cucumbers. So the cucumber pickles, um, these could be, they could be ready in like three or four or five days. Um, in the middle of winter, sometimes it takes about a week or so. If you're going for half sours, probably about that like two, three day range. Um, if you're going for half sour dill pickles, not full sours. Um, so again, it, it's, it's, you're going to do a little bit of trial and error with this. You're going to try some, maybe you part way out, you get things clean and you take off the lid and you pull one out and you take the whole thing out and eat it. You don't put it back in one, once you took a bite, but you take the whole thing out and take it, take, take one out and say, do I like its flavor? And that's the same thing. When I teach my kombucha class, that's, that's a lot of what you do. You stick a straw in, you take a little sip and you're like, Hmm, is it ready? Eventually you get, you get a feel for, it. I know, me, when I'm burping these, I actually can tell when the fermentation has started to stop because when I'm burping them, it starts to produce less gas. When I open it up, it's like, oh, that didn't, really didn't make much of a fizzle anymore. Okay, time to move these to the fridge. And I can trust these, trust that, that they've turned into pickles. You'll also start to see this get cloudy as a few days go on. You'll see that, that action happening. So pickled beets, these are gonna take a little bit longer. Um, so, so with these, you, you might probably about a week's worth of time, they might be ready sooner, but, it, but again, probably about a week, maybe two weeks, um, because they're a root vegetable, they're very dense and fibrous. So now pickled carrots, pickled carrots. So I, again, farmer's market, went to the farmer's market, got the carrots. I don't know if you know this about, but when the carrots have their greens on the tops, um, if you, if you're a farmer and you're selling carrots with the greens on the top, um, they're more desirable for people to buy. However, when the greens are on the top, 
if you leave them in your refrigerator or anywhere with those tops on, it actually pulls moisture from the carrots longer and longer and longer and longer. And so the longer they are in the fridge with those tops on, the drier your carrots become. So if you want nice, nice juicy carrots and everything, chop those tops off as soon as you get home from the farmer's market or wherever. Um, they look pretty, but they're, they're actually, um, you know, they're kind of hindering your ability to have the freshest carrots, the juiciest carrots. Okay, so, gonna get me another jar. Okay, so with pickled carrots, uh, man, pretty basic. Carrots, brine, a little garlic, make them garlicky carrots. Um, that's, that's all this recipe is, okay? So um, as we go down here, we're gonna look for consistency. So there's a little bit of prep that you're gonna watch. I didn't chop, chop all of these up in advance. But um, so garlic again, we give it a smash and toss it in. Could you do more than two cloves? Yeah, totally, go ahead and do more than two cloves. Um, I had one whole head of garlic and I needed to kind of stretch throughout all of these recipes. Some of the recipes called for like four or five cloves. I was like, nah, 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 nah. you're only getting two cloves. It'll be fine, okay. So. Um, with the carrots, you could like, you could take these and julienne them into like really fine strips. So here's the thing, with a carrot, you're more likely to get to the, you know, um, to something where the height, the height is going to go too far in the jar. So that's kind of the first thing that I do is I'm gonna like, you know, use the knife to like line up my carrots. I'm gonna pull out like the longest one there. And yeah, that one, you know, the little end of that. I need it, I need it to be just shy of that top. Um, so really when I'm looking at that, that's now my measuring stick. I can munch on those little carrots. I'm not going to, I, I'll pickle them. Um, with these, um, because these are kind of small already and thin already, what I am going to do is just kind of give them slices in halves. That's going to be fine enough. If I was working with big giant carrots that were really thick, I might, I might take these and like just go ahead and give them a thinner slicing. But these are these are really like organic carrots. They're they're gnarly and everything, and they're not going to be perfectly uniform anyway. You'll see that when I'm cutting these, I'm still using that same strategy. These are round knives slip on round things, um, so I'm using that strategy of pinching from both sides and holding it still as I slice it. Oh boy, that's a that's a twisted one. Almost done. Nobody wants to cut themselves on camera. Okay. So I don't know. I don't know if my kids did get into the carrots before I could stop them. So I don't know if this is going to be enough to fill the jar or if they're going to float. Yeah, it's going to be a small amount of carrots. They're going to float. So I'm going to need, what am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to add weight to this, right? So if I'm packing them in the jar, and I know they might float up above the top up, that, that one. Let's see, can I get it to go further? Yeah, I could get it to go further down. Just making sure none of them are sticking out. If I had enough in here to cram them in the jar, and I even had extras, um, and they didn't move at all. The, like this jar that I had made before, this used to be like packed with carrots where they didn't move at all. Then I wouldn't need to add a weight because they wouldn't float. But these, as I add the brine, as I add the brine, you know, and as time goes on, they're gonna float above that brine. So again, garlic, salt water, that salty water brine, and I filled it too much because I got to add a weight, so I'm just going to do that over the sink. Clean up the jar. And there we go. Um, there we go. We've got, we've got that. So carrots, they tend to take a little longer. Again, they're fibrous roots. So tend to be one or two weeks for these to pickle. Um, if I recall for these back, back way back when, these took two weeks to pickle. Um, and months later, sitting in the fridge, they're still good. So what, what do I mean by that? Again, I'm gonna let these sit. Each one of these I'm gonna let sit on the counter and I'm gonna keep in the back of my mind, like how long do they have to like sit? In the early days, I would take a Sharpie or a grease pen like this and write on the lid what they were and what I used in them. Man, I don't need to do that now. But in the early days, I would write that, that down, even the date in which they were made, um, so that as they were in my fridge and my fridge was filling up with these things, I could tell which ones were the oldest, which I should eat sooner, and which ones, um, you know, you know, what, ooh, I really like that. What was in it? Well, it's on the lid. Um, 
so again, with this, I'm gonna have to burp it a couple times a day. This gets re lots of carbon dioxide, lots of fizziness. So I always burp the carrots over the sink because uh, they, they make a mess. But this just goes to the fermentation station again. Um, so there we go, we got three dishes. Um, it's been a chunk of time. It's time to check in on the sauerkraut. So. Okay, so we've got that bowl. And so here's the thing, let's see if I can do this. If I pull this back, oh, do you see that liquid on the bottom? Yeah, you can see that liquid on the bottom. It's pulled out, and so here's what's happening, is that it's making its own brine. If you remember with this, we just had cabbage, we just had salt, we didn't add any water to this. And now it's ready to pack in the jar. So we're going to add a few of the spices that I said that I like, and it's just gonna be small amounts. The recipes I'm following are just saying just a teaspoon of each. So a teaspoon of juniper berries, and a teaspoon of caraway seeds. Teaspoon, teaspoon, not tablespoon. Very important. So I got those in there. I'm gonna give them a quick mix, but my hands are gonna be dirty. So, so here's the thing. I'm just gonna set the camera up. I'm gonna get everything set up because this is, this is now like the messiest thing, packing this into a jar. Um, so I'm gonna get, get me a new jar, new clean jar, and the packing process for this. A little salt in a cut. Ah! Okay, <laughs> can't prepare for that, huh? Um, I'm gonna mix these spices together. When they're mixed, we're gonna start packing them into a jar, and then, then there'll be a point where I have to leave and go wash my hands and everything. But, all right, so, good, good. Right. Don't need knife, don't need that. I do have brine that I could use in this. So if I pack this and there isn't water coming up to the top of that jar, to that, that area, I could, I could use that brine and I should use that brine to make sure that none of this goes above that water level. But you're gonna see how we kind of really pack this in. I think another thing I need is another, another weight just in case. Okay, so mix. Remember, this is just to mix the spices in. Ooh, I forgot another thing that I, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look at my cabinets and see if I got a funnel for this, a wide mouth funnel for these jars. Secret weapon, okay? <laughs> okay, it's, it's messy. But this, this, it doesn't seem like it helps that much, but it really does reduce the mess. Okay. Remember, this was a whole cabbage. Oh boy. Again, this is where you get the kids involved. However, this part, I'm gonna start, to, there's gonna be an immense amount of pressure I'm going to use to press down on this, to press that down each time. They do make tampers for this where you can tamp it down. I'm gonna to transition to just doing this over the jar. Get that like rubbery sound. Yeah, I'm not gonna try and force all of this into, into one container. However, what I am doing is I'm pushing this down and I'm getting out all of the air, the air bubbles. That's what you, re, you need to do that. With, with this, more so than any other ferment, you need to get those oxygen air bubbles out of there. So you're gonna end up pressing this down, adding more in, pressing it down, adding more in. And here's, what, here's what's happening, as I'm pressing it, there's liquid. That liquid brine is forming on the top, and I haven't even tapped into all the brine that's that's in the bottom of this. So when I when I look at this, this is kind of more of like a two jar amount. Remember, this this cabbage was a little bigger than what I needed. You can't choose the size of the cabbage that you get all the time. Okay. So again, if I needed more brine, I would tap into this and pull brine from that. However, I've got enough to just do this. And as I press that down, I am, I'm gonna add a little bit of this liquid. There we go. Because I want that weight. And some, so with cabbage, more so than any other ferment, so we got a clear distinction between the cabbage that's down here that's gonna turn into sauerkraut, and we've got this, basically this creates its own little airlock where fresh air can't get down into that cabbage. 
cabbage more so than any other ferment will have some little floaties it might have like a gray yeast that grows at the top um, and what you do with that is you scoop it, scoop it out with a spoon, throw it away. You, you don't want black mold or anything like that, but there is a, there's a common gray yeast that grows on the top of, of these that it's not poisonous, but it's not desirable. So, so you scoop it out and everything. You may, so more than any other ferment, you may have to add, um, as this goes on, some of that brine may bubble out as you're burping it, and you may have to make brine in the middle of the week um, for that. So I'm going to go wash my hands and talk a little more about it. Huzzah! <laughs> Fun times. Okay, so cleaning up, cleaning up from the cabbage stuff. We're going to go into kimchi, but still, still a few things to say about that. So yeah, I'm going to put this on. How long does the, so, so with this, you saw the process was different than with the cucumber pickles, and those other, those are fast. This one I had to let it sit, but I didn't necessarily make a brine from this. All the brine came from the cabbage itself and all that salt that I put on it in the beginning. And then I let it sit, really, you can go back in the video and see how long I let it sit for, probably for more than half an hour um, as, as we go. So again, this is gonna sit on the counter, gonna burp it a couple times a day, uh, burp those little jar babies. Um, and then this is one where you can pull that weight out. You can stick a fork in and taste it. T taste it. Don't put the fork back in, but you can put a fork in, a clean fork in, taste it and see, hmm, does it taste like sauerkraut yet? There'll, there'll be a point where the, there's enough acids in there where it starts to taste a little sour, um, that, that, you know, then starts to taste like sauerkraut. Um, and because of those spices that we add there, it's going to taste like the good sauerkraut. Um, you, can put, you, you know what you can do with sauerkraut. Put it on sandwiches, pierogies, what, whatever you do. Um, I've even had it in the morning with eggs. Um, so how long? I've had sauerkraut mature as fast as three days, but this is one where it's like, if you do have basement space, I've read into the science of, of, of sauerkraut and I've tried it myself. This is great if you can let this go in your basement where it's in the high 50s or 60s or so and let it do its fermentation down there for a week or, or so. Um, it might take a couple weeks, but typically within that week's time, that's when I like it. Um, my friend, he likes it after about two weeks worth of time. Okay, yeah, that one more so than any of the other ones is typically going to be one that I put one of those airlocks on. Um, so that during the day, if it bubbles up, it catches it. All right. So let me see. Kimchi. Let's do the pickled eggs before the kimchi. We'll do the pickled eggs. So. Eggs. This is the one where I don't have it in a bowl. I wanted the smell to kind of stay in here. So I've got hard boiled eggs. Hopefully you know how to hard boiled eggs. Um, if not, well, you know, here's the quick, the quick one. You get your water boiling in a pot that's going to be big enough so that when you add those eggs, the water doesn't come out. You get the water boiling, a nice rolling boil. And then you add the eggs. I like to use, I like to use a slotted spoon, adding the eggs one at a time. Uh, if you add them all at once, it can, whatever, it can make splashes with that boiling water. That, that's not safe. Adding them one at a time. And typically uh, when I'm doing this, I'll do a whole dozen eggs. So, you know, about six or so will go in a jar uh, of the pickled eggs. And the others will, will have as egg salad sandwiches and stuff like that. So I actually already had some for lunch today. Um, so, and then I set a timer for 12 minutes. You know, and that's because those eggs came from the refrigerator. If, the, if these were eggs that were fresh shrimp for my chicken coop, then I would probably do boil, let them boil for just 10 minutes since they were already up at like room temperature already. But since those eggs had been in the fridge, they're cold, I'm gonna let them boil for 12 minutes. And then, um, and then I put them in an ice water bath. So it's just a bowl filled with ice and water. And I use the same slotted spoon to pull them safely out of the boiling water and put them in the bath. That's how you make boiled eggs, all right? Let them sit and then since they're in that ice water bath, that makes them really easy to peel. So I peel them directly from that ice water bath. Um, and that's, that's what I've got here. Just peel. Now, this is one where, again, a jalapeno in here, amazing. Add a jalapeno to it. A little bit of dill, a little goes a long way. Tiny little sprig is gonna be fine. A couple garlic cloves um, is, is what this recipe calls for. Now, here's where we get into a big difference between fermenting vegetables, and now we're fermenting, hmm, this ain't no vegetable. Okay, how is this, 
chemically like different <laughs> than, than vegetables. This is high fat, high, high fat, like low sugar, <laughs> um, low cellulose. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have like all that structure that, that, you know, that these do. It's a completely different thing. Um, high fat, high protein, all right? While carrots, carrots, low fat, low protein, high sugar, okay? So, so with these, we're using a brine with this. We're also using a brine with the pickled eggs. However, these lived in a natural environment. And even though I peeled these, these carrots, as I was peeling, small amounts of bacteria, fungi, and stuff like that ended up on the carrots and helped to start the fermentation process. I, th those inoculated it. These, I boiled them. They are dead, dead, dead through and through for the most part. It's kind of like I pasteurized them. You know, and now I'm going to put them in a salty environment. I need to add some life to it. So you'll see in the handout, I'll give you a few examples of what you could do. So if you have, if you have kombucha, you could put a little bit of, you know, homemade kombucha, not the stuff that's sitting on the grocery shelves, it's flavored and everything. Your own homemade kombucha, you could use that as a starter because it has bacteria and yeast and stuff. It's got the stuff that, that'll start to pickle it. If you have this, honestly, I can take a tablespoon of this liquid that's in here that has this bacteria in here and use it to start it. Um, so, so from pickle, so you can use the liquids from previous ferments to kickstart something that's going to be harder to ferment on its own. Um, pickled eggs a lot of times are made with vinegar. Remember, we're doing lacto fermented pickled eggs. No vi vinegar in this at all. We are using bacteria and fungi, you know, to kick this off. So, so what what is, what did I have in the bowl here? Um, in this bowl was, so this, so active, this is alive, kefir, all right, so kefir, kefir, um, this has got active live cultures in it, it's plain, it's not flavored with strawberry or anything like that, it's a drinkable yogurt, amazing stuff, um, you can make this on your own, you can buy a culture and then every week make your own drinkable yogurt, what did I do, I took some cheesecloth, and I poured some in in this strainer, and I had a bowl down here to catch this liquid. Now look, you look at that cloudy liquid. That's what we call is whey, okay? So, so you can use whey from a, an active culture like this, okay? So, so, so this, this kefir, it was made with, with a lactobacillus bacteria. And what we're gonna do is use that to start this off. How long did it take for this to sit? A lot of recipes say let, you know, to collect whey, let it sit overnight. I did this just two hours before we started. And I've got like half a cup of whey in there. That's more than enough. Um, you know, and you know, I could choose to take this and use that. I'm not gonna use it for anything else. I could use it for, you, could, you can make a little thing of cheese, kind of like cottagey cheese type of thing with it. I'm not gonna bother with it. But I have my whey, I have my eggs. And now I want you to see again, how simple is it to make pickled eggs? So it's gonna be repetition is the key to learning. A lot of repetition with this. I've got some dill that I'm putting in my, in my, in my jar. I've got this way. I'm only gonna need a tablespoon, a tablespoon. But here's the thing, bacterial colonies, the size of the colony you start with matters. So if I could put more in here and it's not gonna change the flavor for the worse, why not add more? All right, that, like, that, like, I could put, honestly, I could put this whole like quarter cup, half cup in here. It's not gonna change the flavor of my pickled eggs. So why not start out with a high bacterial load and, and give it a kickstart that it needs? I'm saying that I only need a tablespoon, but what else am I gonna do with this? You know, I don't, I don't need to use it for anything else. So I'm gonna give it a good start of that. Okay, now I got my eggs. I'll get the eggs in there, but first I'm just gonna give this, you know, give the garlic a quick, quick crush, put it in, peel it or not, it's up to you. I tend to not eat the garlic that I have in the pickled eggs, but I tend to eat the garlic that I have in the pickled carrots and the pickled, I don't know, it's, it's something that, you know, these get that eggy flavor and everything, which I could desire. Um, so I'm saying, oh, I didn't chop the table. Um, same thing with these. I, I have found, again, I jalapenos with this, they do something crazy amazing. To, to these eggs. Um, so I'm going to start off with six, six eggs, see how it fills. Two, three, four, five, 
six. Yeah, I can fit. I can fit. I can fit eight in there. So I'm going to go ahead and fit eight. A couple of those were a little cracked. No big deal. Um, and then again, I'm adding brine. I either go make the brine or I add it in. Now, pickled eggs, they, they can float a little, but these are ones where it's like, I don't need to add the weight to them. These are going to be fine just as they are. I'm going to wash my hands. Pickled, egg, pickled eggs are a fast one. So look at that. It's cloudy because of all the, the bacteria that I just added to that. I'm gonna, you'll find that this, because it doesn't have as much sugars as the carrot, it's a high protein, high fat, not a lot of sugars in here. All right, there's sugars in those, in those peppers though. So the bacteria are, and everything, and there's sugars in the, in the garlic. They're gonna primarily feed on the, on the pepper and on the garlic, and then they're gonna produce carbon dioxide and, and acids that keep this churning and that add that like pickled flavor to this. So amazing, and this is, a, this is one of those things that if you make egg salad sandwiches from these pickled eggs, it's gonna blow your mind. And then go ahead and have one of your lacto-fermented cucumber pickles and other stuff. Like take a day like I'm doing and just do the whole day following through these recipes and, and go ahead and make these for yourselves. And you'll have like this big, big uh, menu of items that you can have. Okay, so it goes to the fermentation station. That one is, out of all of them, that's gonna be one of the fastest ferments, probably about three days. All right, so two or three days is all it's gonna to take to get that flavor. Um, so I don't need that. I'm gonna put the caffeine on the fridge. Yeah. So, other things, any other things that I wanna say? I'm just gonna scan through my list here. Scan through my list. We're gonna, we're gonna do kimchi next. Now fruits, one of, the, one of the recipes I like to do, but I, I didn't have the ingredients for it, so just didn't do it, um, is, is um, lacto-fermented <laughs> lacto raspberry jam. Uh, again, this is from one of the books, lacto-fermented raspberry lavender jam. This is a no-cook jam. This is amazing. Instead of being at the stovetop and make it, you know, making your raspberry jam, and everything at the stove top and then, and then canning it and everything. You make it right in the jars that you want and you add, just like, just like we did with the eggs, you add a little bit of whey to kick it off. Um, so when we're talking, so what, you, what you'll learn is as you, as you get good at fermenting vegetables, start with those. Then you can experiment and try some of these other fermentation things that involve um, that involve fruits and other items, maybe cultured cheeses and stuff like that and butter and everything. Um, start with the vegetables. Start, that's what the, the recipes that I'm going through today are great ones for you to start with. And then try something like that fermented raspberry jam. What happens is it ferments, you kick it off with either a little kombucha, a little bit of, of that whey um, as a starter and it breaks down the sugars and it really congeals those raspberries. Yeah, you mash up the raspberries, you toss in a little lavender and some, some lemon juice and stuff like that. If we go through a recipe, let's see. Um, it's got lavender flowers, it's got, some, a little, uh, um, it's got the raspberries in there, like three cups of raspberries, blah, 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 to make a whole pint. Um, it's got some honey in there. So remember I said no, no on honey and stuff like that, but like this, this is a recipe that calls for it. You're adding into there the whey, two tablespoons of whey to kick it off, and a half a teaspoon of pickling salt. So a little bit of salt in there. And again, it's like everything has its reason in it as to why it's in there. And what happens is it makes this jam for you that's a no-cook jam, and it gives you the benefits of a lacto-fermented item that helps with your whole gut system. We didn't even talk about that. That's a whole other thing. How, um, how you feel different after you've eaten these day in and day out fermented foods. It literally changes your body chemistry, um, releasing happy hormones from your gut that then they are, that releases those happy hormones that then change your brain chemistry and make you feel better, you know? Uh, um, all right, blah, blah, blah. Um, what else do I got? So the kimchi. <laughs> Yeah, kimchi's the last one. So let's jump into it. 
it's got a lot of a lot of stuff involved in it um, for flavor for flavor but simple process so this was a napa cabbage napa cabbage that was uh, so basically this recipe i want it to fit in a jar in a, in a, a jar this big if i used the whole cabbage and added radishes and stuff to it i would need a half gallon jar but i want this to fit in a quart jar so i wanted to make sure it would fit in a quart jar so i just used half of a napa napa cabbage head okay so we have that in here and then carrots you know so this was a couple carrots that were that were sliced thin in here the the cabbage was chopped up um in like these two inch like you know one to two inch sections so that it gave you a big chunk if you can imagine with with these as you're picking them out and eating them um, you kind of want them to be like big enough to pick up with chopsticks, you know, so, so that's what you're kind of shooting for is that that kind of size with everything. Um, my the local farmers market, I was really hoping that they had the daikon radishes, they didn't have them yet. Um, and, and so this made with daikon radishes, like the big white radishes there. It's it's amazing. It really adds its own thing. But I've got the carrots in here. So so um, so now with this, what did I do? I chopped them up and then I put them in a brine. And so they sat in here. This, this cabbage itself, it's very leafy, but it's not like the, the, um, the other, the storage cabbage that I used to make the sauerkraut. It doesn't have as much moisture in it. We cannot make enough brine from this. So what did I do is I let this sit in the salt water and the salt water, you know, is kind of like marinating it. And, and so what we're going to do is pour it off. We're just going to do a, a quick pour off of the moisture of the brine. We're going to save that brine. We do not need all of that. So I'm going to pour the rest into this thing. Okay. So we've got our brine from this. Now, by the way, this is just this is just one recipe for kimchi. There are so many variations in it. Oh, by the way, variation. I'm remembering. I'm remembering that I like to add fish sauce to this. The recipe I'm following didn't have fish sauce, but I'm just like remembering that that gives it one of those like great umami flavors to the whole mix. So I've got I've got you know the the cabbage, some of the carrots. Um, here is one of those times where I'm going, I'm going to need my dry hands because I am going to like put on gloves for this for the hot pepper flakes. I just don't want them getting ground into my skin and in my nails and then I accidentally itch my eye and then I've got hot pepper flakes in my eye. Nobody wants that. So I'm, I am going to put on gloves for this. Holy moly, aren't we in a different world where you look at these gloves a completely different way? You're like, oh, you must be grocery shopping. <laughs> oh, are you going to go pump gas? No, no, I'm just making kimchi. All right. They don't need to be perfect. I got wet hands, so they don't really want to go on. But so with this one, this one, this one. Oh my gosh, all these things. All these things here. So the recipe, it's got lots of ingredients. All right, it's got some onions. So I've thinly sliced up some, some onions in here. Um, and it's got some garlic. The garlic is going to be something that I am going to eat. So it is something where I'm going to give a crush. I'm going to peel it. And I'm going to give it a quick little dice up. Okay, another thing that I have in here, these were green onions. I don't know if you know this, but I know this because I'm a farmer, is that green onions are just immature onions. So the, these, these onions, when I actually got down to like part of it, some of them were like in that in-between stage before they turned into a full-sized onion. Um, so I just used the tops from those onions. Again, cut into nice big pieces that you could pick up with chopsticks. So that's two green onions in there, at least. I'm gonna go ahead and, while well, I got, got this, the recipe calls for two tablespoons of this uh, Korean, Korean red pepper flake. Um, I already told you that I don't like things crazy spicy, but this is a nice spice. Um, instead of two tablespoons, I'm just going to add one tablespoon. And then we've got a fish sauce. I'm going to eyeball it. It's about like a little, little glug glug, a little tablespoon or so of fish sauce. 
and we're almost there. There is some extra salt that's added to this. So we've got our brine, but this also has about a half a tablespoon of salt that is added to this mix and sugar. This has a whole teaspoon of sugar added to this to feed it and to kick it off. Again, that's regular table sugar that I pre-measured out. I'm not going for a full mince here, but I'm gonna go for something close. The garlic. Okay, and the ginger. So uh, with the ginger, uh, I'm gonna be mincing it. So, so like I'm, go I'm gonna go to like the super fine um, part of my, of my shredder here. I'm gonna go to this one here and about an inch worth or so. I'm just gonna, I've already peeled it with the knife. So, so anything that I'm kind of shredding up here. Ginger, man, this is just an awesome, awesome ingredient. All right, so we got about an inch of it that's shredded. I love this because then I can just kind of like scoop my knife in here and toss that in. It's got that wonderful smell, wonderful smell. Okay. And now the gloves. We've got all of these awesome spices in here. And I'm, you can kind of see I'm giving it that same massage that I did for, whew, oh man, so good. That same massage that I did for the um, sauerkraut. Is... I'm looking for my handy dandy funnel. Well, okay, I'll just shove it in. All right, so, and with this. So with this, we're packing the jar with the kimchi. And I'm trying not to get any on the outside just because of those hot pepper flakes. I'm gonna be packing it down to get the air bubbles out. You can see why I'm doing this one last because of all the, the spices. And again, gonna be giving it a firm press. I could have added more. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take this one since I've got the room and I'm gonna experiment with this. This has not marinated in the brine. It's not gonna throw anything off, but I'm gonna add this in on top to see what kind of flavors does that get when it's in the mix. It's not gonna throw anything else off, but I, I wanna fill this jar up, man. If I've got all this, you know, if I've got this, this cabbage here and I can make it fit in the jar, I'm gonna make it fit in the jar. Less waste. Okay. Remember, we're gonna get my handy dandy weight. Push that weight in there. Now there's not a lot of brine in there. I'm just trying to get all the oxygen out and I'm gonna do this, do this over the sink. Um, I'm just going to get that same level of brine in here. Yeah, sinks filled up the dirty dishes. I don't know if you can see it. All right. Try not to touch the equipment with this. Okay, so I've got my like my little air layer in here. Everything's covered up. I'm gonna take my spicy gloves off and put a top on. Also, gonna give it a rinse over the sink. Oh my God! Look at that. Look at that. So that, that is like, that's a meal in a jar right there. Now, of course, kimchi is, you know, usually seen as like a side dish, but man, all the flavors that are kind of come out from this, this is basically like a three day ferment. It's got a little extra sugar that we added into there. Um, I have to wash my hands really carefully. But um, again, this is one, we're gonna burp our jar babies. So when we look over, we just like review. We did the sauerkraut right from the get-go. 
We did the cucumber pickles, we, the, you know, those dill cucumber pickles. We did the pickled beets, the pickled carrots, the pickled eggs. We did kimchi. We did also talk about some other things. This is a beginner's class, so I'm not gonna go crazy into everything, but you got some basic recipes that really get you going um, and get you used to the patterns of fermentation, um, this lacto, lactobacillus-based fermentation. Um, so again, clean water, no chlorine in it, um, the right kind of salt, pickling salt or kosher salt, do it by weight, follow a brine chart, follow a recipe. Now let's end, let's end by talking about one of the most important things is how do you know if a ferment is bad? Use your nose, all right? That's gonna be one of the first things, your nose and your eyes. You crack open that jar. If it doesn't smell right, you throw it away. No questions. You don't go, oh, I'll just have a little. No, 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 nobody wants diarrhea. Nobody wants to die. Um, you don't, go, you don't go eating things that smell bad. You were born with this. And if, you're, if your nose, if you're congested and you can't smell, have somebody else smell it. If it smells off, that's not okay. It should smell like pickles. Sauerkraut should smell like sauerkraut. Kimchi should smell like kimchi. And pickled eggs should taste and smell like pickled eggs. So the next thing, your next thing is first smell. I'll tell you what, the, the, the one time that we had a bad ferment with the, with the kids at school, it was a good thing we did because we had a jar of sauerkraut. We had a jar of sauerkraut and it looked normal, looked perfectly normal. You opened up the top though, and what had happened is the brine had evaporated out. Now, there could have been several things that went wrong with it. One, there might not have been enough brine, okay? And so some of the things went above the brine level, got exposed to oxygen and rot. That, that's, that's a likely culprit. One of the kids could have had dirty hands when they were they didn't wash their hands the way we told them to wash their hands, the way that everybody knows how to wash their hands now because of COVID. Okay, so maybe they didn't have clean hands. Maybe they left soap residue inside the jar because we have the kids do all the preparation for this. The eighth graders and seventh graders do all the preparation for this. Maybe they left soap residue in it. Um, maybe we had them measure out the salt. Maybe somebody didn't measure out enough salt and the brine, the, the, you know, there wasn't enough brine, you know, salty, salty, salt, saltiness in this to stop bad bacteria growth. There's a lot of little variables all together. I want you to see these are super simple things to, to control. Look at this, within a couple hours of time, an hour and a half to, you know, where are we? Hour and 40 minutes. Done all those and jibber jabbered quite a bit. I'm, I'm sure those of you watching are like, come on man, wrap it up. But this is an important thing at the end is to talk about rotten things. Your nose, when we opened up that bad jar, it gave us that gag reflex right away. I've never experienced anything like that, but it was literally like a mm, like vomit in the back of my throat, gag reflex. If you get that, you throw it away, okay? So, the, you know, first thing is your smell. If it smells bad, then if it smells fine, take a little taste. If it tastes off, I've had ones where like, I tasted it and I was like, huh, kind of tastes a little chemically. Kind of tastes like a like the 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 one that we smelled that smelled like formaldehyde it really did all right um and but like if it's got like a little chemically flavor to it or anything it, use your judgment if it smells or tastes off or if it looks off the color is way off like if this turned like come you know completely like gray or black or anything use your common sense and get rid of it. <laughs> do not taste it. Do not ingest it. Do not make somebody else taste it for you. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, typically you can tell, you can tell right away if something's bad. Um, okay. Okay. So I think we're at the end. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah. Now you know how to do some of the basic fermentation things.